culture and its laborious emergence from the immediacy of substantial life must always begin by getting acquainted with general principles and points of view. So as at first to work up to a general conception of the real issue, as well as learning to support and refute the general conception with reasons. Then to apprehend the rich and concrete abundance of life by differential classification, and finally to give accurate instruction and pass serious judgment upon it. From its very beginning, culture must leave room for earnestness, for the earnestness of life and its concrete richness. This leads the way to an experience of the real issue. And, when the, and even when the real issue has been penetrated to its depths by serious speculative effort, this kind of knowing and judging will still retain its appropriate place in ordinary conversation. Okay, now this is a very short and very important, dense, little paragraph. There's quite a lot going on here, not only because Hegel is bringing in a bunch of new conceptions that are fleshing out his, his, his idea of what it is that he's aiming at, what it is that he attempts to, to produce in this work, um, but because these are going to play a major role <clears throat> in the very structure of the work. So he starts out talking about culture, and I think that when we see this word culture, uh, we don't want to assume automatically culture as a finished thing. We want to think about the process of becoming cultured, because quite often that's what he's, he's going to be focusing on. So he's talking about culture and its laborious emergence. Emergence from what? From what, we, what he calls substantial life. Now this requires some, some lingering over this and some explanation. Hegel thinks that in many societies and in many people's experience, they are, at, at, at the point that he's looking at them, caught up in what he calls substantial life. Where Think about this term substance. Substances are what are real, what actually are out there, the things you can bump into, they're, they're the things that matter. They have value. Oftentimes they're, they're sort of a self-evidency about them. So your substantial life as a student could include things like needing to buy your books. You just sort of take that for granted as part of student life. But then somebody could come along and say, why buy books? Why not simply rent them? Why not get an electronic version of the text that perhaps you can download through a torrent? Not, not advising this, by the way. Um, just pointing it out as, as a, a way in which the unity and the sort of sleep, sleepiness of substantial life can be shaken and then broken. And somebody says, oh yeah, yeah, now they're actually posed with what should I do? Should I, uh, before, I, I was just going to go this way and I wasn't even going to think about it. Now I have to decide, do I go this way, or this way, or this way? Which one's better? How do I figure out which one is better? Mm, I, have to, I have to, you know, discuss this. And you could, like, fall back into substantial life. He calls this immediacy, meaning that there's nothing mediating it. It is just mediating itself. It's sort of what in, in other philosophical um, traditions, you know, the, the later phenomenology of, of Husserl they would call the natural attitude. Or, um, you know, when, when Hume, or when, when Kant was talking about his dogmatic slumber, that could be something like substantial life. So, what is culture? Culture is coming out of substantial life. Not necessarily throwing it away altogether or demonizing it, saying, ah, oh, it's terrible, it's horrible, we have to always be thinking constantly and examining everything. Don't ever take anything for granted. That can, by the way, become its own substantial life. The hippy-dippy, you know, question everything. That turns into its own kind of weird, constricted substantial life that, that um, Hegel calls skepticism later on. In any case, culture is an emergence from substantial life through acquiring general principles. 
general principles are something more than just following along with the rules, kind of, not blindly, but, but um, unthinkingly. General principles are things that you can actually identify as, hey, these are principles. Now that you may have good principles or bad principles, uh, he's not concerned about it at that point. But having general principles allows you to arrive at a articulate thought or conception, a way of seeing things, a gedanka in this, of what? Of the real issue, of what it is that you want to study. So, again, if we want to use power relations, um, in real life worlds or or what other people call cultures, not what Hegel's calling culture, culturation. Um, you have all sorts of power relations. Some people are higher, some people are lower. There's expectations that go along with it. Habits help form this. Um, you know, reward and punishment affect this. And people come to sort of take this as just, this is just the way things are. And then they start thinking about general principles. Well, why are, why are things this way? Um... Well, because it's better for all of society, or the ancestors decided this. So then you start thinking in terms of general principles, and there's a critical element to this. So if the ancestors went along with this, does this mean that everything that the ancestors did is automatically good? How do we apply that principle? And you start to arrive at more and more sophisticated, more and more self-articulating forms of, of thought. And... Those are what allow you to pull yourself out of substantial life. So, and that's what allows you to understand the thing, the zaka. Um, if you want to understand power relations, you have to exercise your mind and exude a sort of dissolving substance to a certain degree, thereby. Um, there was a, a famous philosopher, and I can't remember who it was, he was a materialist who said, um, the mind secretes thoughts the way that uh, the stomach secretes, or the liver secretes bile. And I think Hegel would sort of go along with that. The active mind actually secretes thoughts which cling to things, which, you know, latch into them. Thoughts are an active, uh, an active process. So to think about power relations is already, in a certain respect, to begin to question them. I mean, you might come back to the point where you say, hey, I'm all for them. Uh, whoever's on top, good for you. Everyone else should obey. But that's different than the sort of unthinking, dreamy, sleepy, substantial life. So um, what does the person end up learning how to do who is cultured? I only put one thing up here, classification. But Hegel talks about being able to support or being able to, to contradict or criticize the general conception that one has by giving reasons, by considering, you know, um, arguments, we could say. Um, to apprehend the rich and concrete abundance of life by differential classification. Differential classification means saying how things are actually different from each other. So going back to power relations once again as an example, merely an example, the person uh, now, by having some sort of way of looking at things, some sort of theoretical way of looking at things, is able to begin classifying things in the realm of concrete experience. And doing that, that act of classification helps make these things more understandable, more intelligible. It removes them from their immediacy, because now they're mediated through the classification. Um, to be able to give accurate instruction and pass serious judgment upon it. Part of culture is passing on culture. Every generation of students that come into our classrooms for us educators, are in the place where we were, a gener in my case, a generation ago, for some professors two generations ago, for some professors newly minted, just, you know, where they were a few years before. And what we have to do to them, what we have to awaken in them, what we have to inculcate in them, is what was done with us. And it's going to be somewhat different from case to case to case, of course. It's not always going to be just, you know, 
stamping out a, a uh, process of, of mere imitation or you know mere replication, we're helping them to become cultured. To become cultured for, for Hegel means to be able to think about things, to pull yourself out of the society, the way of thinking that everybody else around you has, and think in general terms, be able to hold on to those thoughts, be able to provide reasons, to be able to, to think about that, to think about thinking, to be able to classify, and to be able to teach others, to be able to pass that on, and to be able to pronounce judgments that are not just some made-up, pulled-out-of-the-air feeling or opinion but actually have some sort of basis. So, this is what culture consists of. Um, we might think about it as culture and education and development all rolled into one. So he says, from its very beginning, culture must leave room for the earnestness of life and its concrete richness. Our lived lives are extremely rich if we actually pay attention to what's going on in them. You know, people talk these days about mindfulness People like Hegel were doing mindfulness and doing it on, you know, uh, infinitely higher power than these, these mindfulness practitioners that, that go around and get paid for doing these workshops today even suspect. Because he's saying our, our immediate lives, if we pay attention to them, are extremely rich. The problem is we need to be able to make sense out of what is actually going on in them. So we have a sort of Fork, uh, uh, yeah, fork in the road at this point, he says, even when the real issue has been penetrated to its depths by serious speculative effort. And that's sort of what he's sketching out here. It's always possible for us to fall back into this. I think a lot of educators themselves fall back into a kind of substantial life of how they conceive education and how everybody else talks about it. You know, I see this happening in a lot of different venues, education theory, and you know what people call assessment, which you know sometimes isn't really assessment, course design, all these sorts of things. It's easy to fall into a kind of um, analog to, to groupthink. And I don't want to use the group, word groupthink because it has these sinister connotations because of 1984. Just think of it as sort of a, a nice warm womb in which the nutrients are constantly flowing and there's not a lot of struggle required. Real thought for Hegel requires struggle. The true shape in which truth exists can only be the scientific system of such truth. To help bring philosophy closer to the form of science, to the goal where it can lay aside the title love of knowing, and be actual knowing, that is what I have set myself to do. The inner necessity that knowing should be science lies in its nature, and only the systematic exposition of philosophy itself provides it. But the external necessity, so far as it is grasped in a general way, setting aside accidental matters of person and motivation, is the same as the inner, or in other words, it lies in the shape in which time sets forth the sequential existence of its moments. To show that now is the time for philosophy to be raised to the status of a science would therefore be the only true justification of any effort that has this aim. For to do so would demonstrate the necessity of the aim would indeed at the same time be the accomplishing of it. In this section, Hegel is really charting out for you in a very positive, straightforward way, some of the main themes and thrusts of, of this, this work. And he's got this great catchphrase, which may bother some people, depending on their theory of truth. He talks about the true shape of truth. Oftentimes when you see this word shape um, or structure, you want to think uh, in terms of gestalt. Uh, and, and that's an important term for, for Hegel, um, the true form, the true mode, the, the manifestation, the, the true articulateness of it. 
Um, it's possible for truth in Hegel's system, or a truth, at a certain point, to be less than fully true. That may be a little mind-blowing for some. How can true actually be sort of a predicate of itself? But we'll get to that. Uh, some of these things you have to sort of take on faith until we get a little bit further on, further on in in the phenomenology. That was part of the point that he was making about how hard it is to write a preface. But there, truth is going to be a criteria for itself. And this is not a completely new idea. You know, um, the medievals had this conception of the, the truth is actually the criterion for itself and for falsity. Now, truth is something for Hegel that develops, that is active, that involves a, t a sort of subjectivity and a sort of agency. So truth is going to be able to reflect upon itself at certain points and say, well, I'm not completely true. I need to be truer than I, than I am. Really interesting thought that's going to be a lot of fun for us to, to pull out. Now, Hegel will say that the only way in which truth, in, in a you know, philosophical sense, and that means in the best sense for Hegel, right? The best, most expansive, most encompassing sense. The only way in which that is going to be able to be fully presented, fully consolidated, is in terms of a scientific system of truth. So that means taking in truths in the, the multiple and making them all part of one big truth without distorting them in the process, without, you know, leaving parts out that don't fit. You have to find some way to actually synthesize all of this together. Huge challenge. And you have to do so in a systematic way. That means that things can't all just be left out like on a, on a workbench, you know, cluttered up. They can't all be placed into their, their compartments and have no connection with each other. Their integral connections with each other have to be part of the very system itself. The system itself has to be scientific, meaning that it has to be oriented towards knowledge that is actually assured of itself as knowledge. That's not a, how we often think of science. When we do think of that, we usually think of the scientific method and hypothesis, and then it starts to get very hazy for most of us because we've forgotten what we learned in our high school science classes or the college classes that we had to take. But, you know, the experimental method is really only part of what makes science science. It's also being able to provide explanations that can be, you know, correlated to other things. And actually, philosophers of science and scientists themselves often get into to debates and disputes about precisely what counts as science, precisely what scientific method entails. So it's, it's not quite as cut and dry as, as people would like to think. For Hegel to be scientific means that it is going to necessarily be systematic and it's oriented towards generating a type of knowledge. So he says, for philosophy, the question is, is it going to remain just love of knowing? That drives it. Or is it going to proceed to actual knowing? Is philosophy going to quit puttering around or quit developing, quit being something potential, and become something actual, become actual knowledge articulated in a systematic way, scientifically, to provide <clears throat> an understanding of the totality without leaving anything out? putting each thing in its, in its appropriate place, including the one who is putting things in place. Tall order. So he says, the inner necessity that knowing should be science lies in its nature. Knowledge, by its very nature, wants to be science. It desires to become science. It wants you to think about you know, a bit of knowledge doesn't just want to sit in your head by itself. It wants to be correlated to other things. It wants to be brought into a system with other parts as sort of moments of a constellation, moments of a greater whole. And you can go along with that or you can resist it. And some of our habits, you know, tend to, tend to resist that. 
So he says the, the external necessity, so far as it's grasped in a general way, setting aside accidental matters of person and motivation, here's how we, we want to be scientific, is the same as the inner. Or in other words, it lies in the shape in which time sets forth the sequential existence of its moments. Remember we talked about development before? That's part of what it means to have this scientific, systematic way of looking at things. It doesn't mean, by the way, that you would have to totally exclude your own personality, your own concrete experience from things. But we do want to generalize. We do want to learn how to, as I, we just said in the previous section, go through that process of becoming cultured. That is part of the process of attaining truth for, for Hegel. So, uh, what else do we have in here? There's a, a, a clarion call that's taking place here. And this is really important. He says, to show that now is the time for philosophy to be raised to the status of a science. What that would mean is philosophy as actual knowing actually becomes science. It hasn't been so before. That's why the scientists, and that's why the, you know, uh, somewhat skeptical philosophers like you know Kant in some of his writings, and definitely Hume can say, the history of philosophy up until this point has been a history of errors, as there's nothing scientific about it. You know why? Because it's never actually been fully brought to its realization in actual knowing through some sort of scientific system of truth. These go together with each other. Hegel's saying, the time is now, and who's the guy to pull it off? Hegel. Not because Hegel is, you know, himself smarter than Plato or Aristotle. He is pretty, pretty brilliant. I mean, you have to give him that. But he doesn't think of himself as more brilliant than those guys. He happens to occupy the right time and place. This process of development has been, has been occurring through the centuries, through the millennia. And not just in philosophy, but through all the different things that fall under culture, like law, like politics, like economics, like religion, like art. All of these have been leading up to a crux in a person who's now going to be in the right place at the right time to finally bring philosophy to the level of development that it has been desiring to be at without fully understanding what that would mean this entire time. This is why he says, to show that now is the time for philosophy to be raised to the status of a science would be the only true justification of any effort that has this aim. The proof of whether Hegel is successful lies in the entirety of the phenomenology of spirit. This entire system. In order to pass judgment upon Hegel, what that means is, if he's right about this, you would have to be able to go through and understand all of the moments and all of the dialectics, all of the, 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 state, the shapes of consciousness and the entire process of development. And then you'd be able to say, yeah, I think he got it right or he got it wrong in these respects. By the way, I, I actually do think that um, he got it wrong in certain respects and that the dialectic is not as simple as he, he made it out to be. And I'm not, you know, I'm not um, the only person who thinks so. You know, really, if you're going to philosophize after Hegel and want to be, in some respect, a dialectical philosopher, you probably have to disagree with him on that respect or on that, that topic. But before you do that, you need to actually see how all these things fit together. Hegel saying the only way that you can adequately judge the system as a whole is on the basis of looking at the system as a whole. Not just a part of it, definitely not just the, you know, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, triangle and saying, oh, that doesn't apply to everything. Hegel would say, that's not exactly what we mean by scientific system. To lay down that the true shape of truth is scientific, or what is the same thing, to maintain that truth has only the notion as the element of its existence seems, I know, to contradict a view which is in our time as prevalent as it is pretentious, and to go against what that view implies. Some explanation, therefore, seems to be called for. Even though it must for the present be no more than a bare assertion, like the view that it contradicts. If, namely, 
the true exists only in what or better as what is sometimes called intuition, sometimes immediate knowledge of the absolute, religion or being, not at the center of divine love, but the being of divine love itself, then what is required in the exposition of philosophy is, from this viewpoint, rather the opposite of the form of the notion. For the absolute is not supposed to be comprehended. It is supposed to be felt and intuited. Not the notion of the absolute, but the feeling and intuition of it must govern what is said and be expressed by it. Now, in this section, Hegel is going to begin to engage in some more criticism of some of the prevalent points of view in, in the world of thought of his own time. And he's starting out by saying, if it's really the case that the shape of truth is necessarily scientific, or put in another way, or what's equivalent to it, to say that truth has only the notion, and we'll come back to that in a moment, as the element of its existence. Um, then what, it, what do the implications does that have? That means that oversimplifying ways of, of trying to apprehend truth are not going to be successful. They may appear to be successful, and that's exactly what's wrong with them, that they can actually seduce you off the path, the laborious, uh, systematic, process-oriented path to truth, and think that you can sort of just shoot yourself at like a cannonball directly at the real, at the, the, the matter itself, at the truth, and that you can actually arrive there. So what is he going to contrast to this in this paragraph? He brings up this term, let me put a dividing line here, intuition. Um, there, there are some, and they included philosophers, who would say that um, in order to grasp truth, you can't do it in any sort of mediated way, any sort of conceptual, systematic, scientific way. It has to be through intuition. It has to be, when we say intuition, what we mean is some sort of direct, uh, unmediated grasp of truth or, or reality. So some people, you know, talk about mystical experience in, in terms like this. Um, you know, mystical experience is a very deep and, and vexed topic, so I don't want to overgeneralize. But some people use the word mystical basically to mean things that are matters of intuition. Um, you can also say that some things are matters of, of intuition necessarily. Um, like, you know, sensation to a certain extent fits into that. How do you know if you're in pain? Well, you actually feel that you're in pain. Of course, it's not quite so simple once we start looking at it carefully and we start realizing that pain is a relationship between nerves and, and the, the brain and how we feel about things and external things. Now, suddenly, it's, it's actually mediated. Um, but some people have this notion that you could have an unmediated, direct apprehension of truth. Not only that you could, but that's the way it has to be. So, for example, Spinoza, um, who Hegel liked quite a bit for some, some, you know, parts of his philosophy. Spinoza thinks that ultimately we need to have a type of knowledge that's of substance or God um, that is not like the discursive kind of knowledge that we, we have. Hegel would say, no, discursive knowledge is where it's at. And this is where this, this word notion comes in. It also gets translated in other versions as concept. And this is a really important bit of, of Hegel's philosophy. Begriff in, in German is what's being translated here. And begreifen means to literally to sort of like grip onto, right? And if you think about it, when you're, when you're wrapping your mind around something, you're not just like having one sort of lightning bolt of intuition. You're doing a process where you're kind of, think about feeling somebody's face and, and their features and figuring out who they are. Um, and maybe being, you know, maybe it's enjoyable or maybe you're horrified by, by what you find on their face. Um, 
it's got, there's parts to the process, and those parts are all connected to each other in one, one main structure or, or gestalt, one main whole. And the parts of that whole are things that you can just take away and have the same, the same thing, the same experience, the same understanding, the same comprehension. Philosophy, as the study of the real, as the study of the totality, as the study of what's, what's most true, even the nature of truth, Hegel thinks can't afford to lapse into flights of intuition, but has to try to work out things in terms of the notion, in terms of a scientific systematic understanding of things. So he says... Um, if the true exists only in what, or better as what, is sometimes called intuition, sometimes immediate knowledge of the absolute religion or being, not at the center of divine love, but the being of divine love itself. I mean, this is part of what makes it so attractive to talk about intuition, because it's like, I want to have a direct experience. I don't want my experience mediated with words and concepts and knowledge. I want to have the thing itself right on top of me or in me, or I want to be in it. I want to experience reality directly. Some people try to do this, by the way, through their, their senses. They figure, hey, if I just get out there and surf, or if I, you know, get myself into a fight, or they, they try to do, you know, or having sex, you know, for a moment I'll, like, experience unmediated reality itself. But that's the problem, one moment. And from a Hegelian perspective, that one moment thing isn't even that one moment. All you remember is your reconstruction of that later on. And that's not quite the same thing as something that sustains over time that you can, you can actually carry around with you as an integral part of who you are. So he says, um, the absolute is not supposed to be comprehended for these people. It's supposed to be felt, intuited. Not the notion of the absolute. But the feeling and intuition of it must govern what is said and must be expressed by it. Hegel thinks that this is a fundamentally misguided way of going about things. And now, it's worth thinking for a moment, before we go on to the next section, why would people as sophisticated as, for example, Spinoza, say we need to have this, this intuitive knowledge, this third type of knowledge in Spinoza's case, of what is most real. It's really, from Hegel's perspective, a failure of nerve. It's not an optimism, it's really a kind of pessimism about our own human capacity to make our way to the absolute by way of progressively, integratively, synthesizing knowledge, bit by bit by bit, painful bit, quite often laborious bit, which is an achievement for us. Intuition is kind of cheap. It's like the easy man's way. And the problem that he's going to talk about a little bit later on you don't know whether your, your intuition is actually an intuition of something or whether you're just kind of making it up or whether your neurons are kind of spinning out. So he's, he's engaging in some criticism here in this section, and he's going to continue this criticism for a bit as, as well in other sections.